All right. Uh, we've been in a three-week series called Three Steps to Victory. The first week was Stop Believing Lies. Last weekend was Stay in the Word. Here's the third one, last one in this series, Start Going to Church. Now, what you're thinking is, well, I am here. I don't need this one, Pastor. Well, the emphasis is not on start. The burden the Lord gave me is the own going. Start going to church. Now, here's what I mean by that. Um, I want you, when you can't come, to watch on the Internet. And I want you, even if you decide not to come, just because you're too tired to watch on the Internet. Don't, don't stop watching on the Internet, okay? Not saying anything bad about that. Or if you live outside the Metroplex or whatever, I want you to watch on the Internet. I want you to. But I just, so this isn't a correction. This is just to answer a question that's beginning to come up more and more and more, I think, since so many pastors... Their messages are, are available at any time online. Um, people watch me on television all over the world. I think our program's on like 32 times a week uh, on different networks. Uh, we're actually, many of you know, we're on Fox 4 on Sunday mornings right before the NFL today. It's pretty cool because I'm on in sports bars, you know? So... <clears throat> Uh, one of the members of the church said he was in a restaurant, and beside him was at the sports bar, and he said all of a sudden he, he, he heard this guy said, hey guys, he's on. And all these guys gather around the bar with their beer mugs <laughs> and watch Pastor Robert before the NFL today. So. So you can watch me on television, you can watch you on the internet, and that's all great. But I just want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, this isn't church attendance for church attendance sake. I want to actually answer the question, why go to church? Why go? Why not just watch? What's the difference? And if you can't, again, if you can't come, then watch. If you're out of town or if you're traveling or if you're, um, want someone sick in the family or something, then watch. But if you can, why make the effort? And I have three reasons. Is that a shocking to you? I got three reasons. Now that reminds me, there was a guy that got up one morning on Sunday morning and told his wife, I'm not going to church today, and I'll give you three good reasons why I'm not going. He said, number one, I don't like the building. I just don't like it. I've never liked the building. Number two, I don't like the people. And number three, the people don't like me. I can just tell it. They look at me funny. They just don't like me. And so she did, as all ladies have to do at some time or another, she said, well, I'll give you three good reasons why you are going, buddy. <laughs> she said, I've gotten up and I'm going. Number two, the kids have gotten up and they're going. Number three, you're the pastor and they're expecting you to be there. <laughs> so, but what happens if the pastor comes and the people don't come? So that's what I want to talk to you about, all right? So here's number one reason to go to church. God's presence. Now, I understand that God is everywhere. That's called his omnipresence. Then there is his inner presence, inner, I-N-N-E-R, when the Holy Spirit lives within us. But there is his manifest presence, which is his made known presence, which happens when we come together in a more powerful way than I've ever seen in my life. So I want to show you a few scriptures, all right? When, when, they were, when God told them to make a tabernacle on earth, the very first one ever, this is Moses, the tabernacle of Moses, Moses' tabernacle before Solomon's temple, all that, he gave them some instructions, and by the way, he said, what you see in heaven, build on earth. So this tabernacle, the pattern for it is in heaven. And this is what he said, Exodus 25, verse 8, and let them, that's the people, make me, God, a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. I want a place to live on earth. 
Exodus, and then later down in verse 22, he says, and there, talking about the sanctuary, there I will meet with you and I will speak with you. Something happens when we come together. And then Jesus even confirms this in the New Testament, Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. It's his presence. Now, I, I, I'll bet you can remember some worship services when you sense God's presence more than ever you've ever sensed him before. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. When the whole body is coming together and we're worshiping God, his presence is so strong. You know, when he got angry with the people as they were of Israel when they're traveling through the wilderness, he said to Moses, I'm not going to go with you into the promised land, but I'll send my angel. Moses' reply was, if your presence doesn't go, I don't want to go. And he made an incredible statement. He said, if your presence doesn't go with us, how will we be different from any other people in the world? It's the only thing that makes us different. Listen, it's the only thing that makes the church different from every organization in the world. Every organization in the world, every meeting in the world, the reason we're different is because God shows up himself when we meet together. God's presence is here. When I was in my early 20s, I got invited to a Lions Club meeting. And I want you to think about, not the way Gateway is our services, but maybe a church you grew up in or something. But I remember I walked in, and there was someone greeting us at the door and handed us a bulletin of what was we were going to do that day. We got our seat, and we had an opening prayer. This is a Lions Club meeting. We opened with prayer. Then we sang some hymns, actually sang hymns. They had hymnals. Then... A guy got up and uh, gave some announcements, and then they, we took an offering. We gave an offering to help people, and then he read some scriptures out of the Bible and talked about being good, and then he said at the end, now if anyone wants to join, you come down here to the front, and then we said a closing prayer. And I thought, I've seen this before. And so I said to the Lord, Lord, What's the difference between a Lions Club meeting and church? He said church is when the lion shows up. That's church. If the lion of the tribe of Judah doesn't show up, all you've had is the Lions Club meeting. A bunch of people sitting around talking about the lion. But when the lion shows up, you've had church. That's the difference. It's the only thing that makes us different from any people in the world is the presence of God. And the presence of God is so strong when we gather together. There's an exponential factor that we're going to talk about on point two when we come together. And it's all through scripture. Um, I, I, on each point, I share a, a testimony to illustrate the point. And all three of the testimonies today are from when I was at Shady Grove Church. God just, just reminded me of these three. And Pastor Olin's down here on the front row, one of our apostolic elders, he's my pastor, and he was my pastor. Then I was there at Shady Grove from 22 until 38 when I started Gateway Church. So I grew up in the Lord. You remember I got saved at 19, I was almost 20, so I went to Shady Grove when I was 22. So that's where I grew up in God and learned much of the things that I'm sharing with you. So anyway, one, uh, I remember there's this guy, and he was, he shared his testimony one time, and um, he'd been in a rock band. He was playing bass on the worship team. And he shared about how he got saved. He was living with a girl. And she went, someone invited her from work to church, to Shady Grove. And she got saved. And she came home and said, I'm moving out. And no one at church said anything to her about it. She just knew in her heart. And she, he said, well, you're moving out. She said, well, we're not married. And I'm not going to live in sin. He said, well, what brought this on? She said, I went to church and I got saved. And she said, and I, I, I'm telling you, you can feel God in the music. She didn't know any of, she didn't know the word worship even. You can feel God when they play the music. He said, well, I'd like to, I'd like to see this. So he comes the next week and the worship starts and to hear him tell it, it was so funny because he said, when the worship started, he said, I started getting physically sick. And he said, I remember thinking, I'm going to throw up. I'm going to throw up. He said, he said, I thought, I'm going to hurl on the back of this lady right in front of me. 
my throw up is going to hit her in the back of the head and flow down her back on this pretty drive. I'm going, to, I'm going to throw up. So he turns to his girlfriend, who's been saved a week, and he said to her, I have to leave. I'm getting sick. She's been saved a week. This is what she said. Shut up. It's demons. <laughs> pretty good theology. <laughs> she has demons. They're just trying to keep you from getting saved. So he said, you know what, when she said that, he said, I thought to myself, that makes sense. And he said, I wasn't sick anymore. He stopped believing a lie. So he's standing there and his worship, he said, all of a sudden, he said, I could feel God too. And he said, think, now think about this. He said, I could feel God and I knew that I was a sinner and that I was going to hell and I needed to be saved. Notice, and by the way, notice three points. That's the way God speaks. He said, I knew I was a sinner. I was going to hell, and I needed to be saved. That's why I knew that. So he said to his girlfriend, I want to be saved. She said, well, in a little while, the pastor's going to get up. Pastor Owen, pastor's going to get up, and he's going to say, if you're a visitor here, and you want to get saved, then you come down to the front. So maybe the week before, he said something about, you know, if you're visiting, you can still come and accept Christ or something. But he used the word visitor or visiting, you know. So that's what she thought. Well, that week, we had a guest speaker. But Pastor Olin decided, I'll do the welcome. I'll welcome everyone. So after worship, everyone was seated. He walked up. He said, I want to welcome all the visitors. <laughs> when he said visitors, this guy got up and started walking down the front. <laughs> and he stood right here. And Pastor Olin's standing there, so he says, hey. <laughs> he said, can I help you? And this guy said, yes, sir, I'm a visitor. And he said, well, good. Is there something I can do for you? And he said, yes, sir. He said, I'm a visitor. He said, I I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell. I need to be saved. I'm a visitor. <laughs> to him, members were saved and visitors were sinners on their way to hell and need to be saved. See? So Pastor Olin led him to Christ right there. No sermon had been preached, but the presence of God showed up. We need to go to church because God's there. It is, let's not forget, it is God's house. So number one is presence. Here's number two, his power, God's power. Now we read Matthew 18, 20 a moment ago. They have two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst. Let me just show you the verse right before it, verse 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And then he says, for, this word for is a preposition which means because, because, this is why it's done. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. See, many people have never connected these two. The reason that what you ask is done is because he's standing right there with you. His presence is there. And when his presence is there, his power is there. If his presence is there, then his power is there. So many people won't need, won't and need the power of God in an area of their life, but they don't go to church. We have, every weekend, we have around 31,000 in attendance. But we decided a while back to see how many people are attending on a regular basis at least once a month. But we came up with this criteria, if they check their children in, if they give, uh, or if they sign up for some sort of a class or any, uh, at least once a month for six months in a row. So in other words, we're missing some people who, who don't give, maybe they're new, they, or they haven't learned that revelation yet, or they don't have school-age children, uh, elementary, you know, age, or, they don't, uh, or they're not signed up for a class. So this number is higher than this. But just of those people, who attend at least once a month for six months, who do one of those, one of those three things, not all three, just one, 72,000. Almost two and a half times. So I want you to think about this. So, <laughs> and that's great to me. It's great. When I grew up, we went to church three times a week. Sunday morning. Anyone want to finish this? <laughs> Sunday night and Wednesday night. And that was if we didn't have Tuesday visitation that week or whatever, you know. 
or Thursday Bible study or was Saturday morning men's breakfast. Okay, at least three times a week. I'm not advocating that. I'm not even advocating four times a month every weekend because I know we travel and we have kids' events and things like that. But I'd like it to be more than once or twice a month. And not for attendance sake. You have to understand, I have no ulterior motive. I don't need a higher number, okay? And that's not why I'm doing this. It's for you. I know what happens when we come together. God's power is exponential when we come together. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 30. How could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight? It's the power of God. <laughs> See, um, uh, people um, sometimes have a difficult time committing to a church. Um, sometimes people could be like, uh, butterflies or bullfrogs. <laughs> uh, butterflies will just flit around from church to church and never light very long at any one place. And bullfrogs will come and sit on your lily pad until someone touches them, tries to develop a relationship with them, then they blow up and hop off somewhere else. <laughs> Some people view churches like restaurants. Uh, what are you in the mood for this week? You know, you're in the mood for Prestonwood or Fellowship or Gateway or, you know, what are you in the mood for? Uh, I've had people tell me, we come to Gateway some, and that's great if they have a home church. So I said to them, so what's your home church? And many times they'll say uh, another good church here that we have a relationship with, Tony Evans, Oak Cliff, or someone, you know. Uh, but sometimes they say, well, we don't really belong anywhere. We just kind of take the best from everywhere. Well, there's a real problem with that. The problem is that you're missing what God designed for church to be. You're, you're missing something. Uh, let me just show you. So I've said to people before, you need to be planted. You need to be planted. Let me show you where I base that on. Psalm 92, 13, and 14. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Planted. Now, just a ten, they're planted, shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. Again, watch. Fruit, fresh, and flourishing. Three points. <clears throat> it's all through the Bible. <laughs> Got Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, so never mind. <clears throat> but they don't, that's only, that verse is only good for those who are planted, not those who flit around from church to church. You want to be planted somewhere. Um, another testimony from Shady Grove that's now our Grand Prairie campus. Uh, Pastor Olin was doing marriage counseling with this couple. And after a little while, he said, I don't think I can help you anymore. And they were down, you know, discouraged about it. He said, what do you mean? He said, the only thing that can help you is the presence of God. You need a touch from God. So he said, my advice to you is keep coming to church. Just keep coming to church and keep worshiping God and let God do a miracle in your hearts. So they did. And one time during worship, just a few weeks later after he told them that, the presence of God was just all over the place. And it's back when pastors would stand on the uh, platform during worship. And he just felt the Holy Spirit said, open your eyes and look what I'm doing. And he opened his eyes, and his eyes fell on this couple. They were both standing there like this, tears streaming down their cheeks, worshiping God. And right when Pastor Olin looked, the man took his arm like this and put it around his wife. And then she put her arm around his waist. And they stood there a minute, and then they turned and they faced each other, and he said something to her. She said something to him, and then they hugged and they cried, and then they turned back. He's got his right hand in the air, his arm around her, she's got her arm around him, and her left hand in the air. And their marriage was healed, just like that, in the presence of God. He went on to become an elder in the church to be very successful in business. As a matter of fact, probably most of you have something in your home that he invented. 
has given. Lots of money to the kingdom of God, and they've been married over 50 years now. Still married, still going strong. You know what saved their marriage? Obviously God, but through church. Just coming to church. God's power. And here's number three, God's people. God's people. Now, what you may be thinking is, well, well if I've got God's presence and God's power... Why do I need God's people? I'm going to tell you why, but here's just to sum it up. Because his presence and his power flows through his people. You need people. You know, I've heard people say, just me and God, just me and God. First of all, it's not grammatically correct. <clears throat> just if you're going to say it, say God and I. <clears throat> but just me, it's just me and God. That's all I need God. That's not the way God set it up. You need someone else. Out of all that God created, everything was good except for one thing, man alone. <laughs> I mean, God said at the end of every day, it's good, that's good, that's good. Creates Adam and says, it's not good. I can do better than that. <laughs> 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 and he did. <laughs> so let me show you a few scriptures here. about. I don't think we sometimes realize how incredible it is to be called the people of God. Because many of us don't have any type of a Jewish heritage. We've been grafted into the nation of Israel. But the Jews understood it. The Jewish people did. So let me show you uh, some scripture where Peter's writing to Gentiles and where Paul's writing to Gentiles. 1 Peter 2.10 Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Now he's quoting Hosea. 
And you'll see Paul actually mentions that, Romans 9.25. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people. And this is a scripture in Hosea, Hosea 2.23. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. It's good to be a part of the people of God. But we need other people. Uh, Jesus backs it up. They come to him and say, what's the greatest commandment? He says, well, obviously love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the second is like it. And that word means equal to. The second is equal to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he makes an incredible statement on these two commandments. Hang all the law and the prophets. The law of the first five books of the Old Testament, the prophets are the rest. The major prophets and minor prophets. And by the way, you've got to remember, they didn't have a New Testament when Jesus was speaking. They were the New Testament, so they didn't have one at that time. So when Jesus referred to the scriptures, the law and the prophets, what he was saying was, the whole Bible hangs on these two commandments. And let me say those two commandments a, di a different way. Love God, love people. Let me say a different way. Relationship with God and relationship with people. You need both. You need both. So why? Why do we need God's people? So Paul's addressing that in 1 Corinthians. And he's putting some things in order, but he's also encouraging them in some things they're doing. He's just trying to help them do it better. But he makes a statement that you need to kind of understand his writing because he'll ask a question, then he'll answer it himself. And none others, sometimes you've, he'll say, uh, what's the conclusion then? And then he'll answer it. Or he'll say, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then obviously the answer is, God forbid. And he, he, he answers, all right? So this is what he does in this one. He says, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, how is it then, brethren? In other words, how, how is all this? How's all this work? And then he answers it. Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, that all things be done for edification. Edification means building up. But apparently what he's saying is the way you get built up is by someone else's song, by someone else's teaching, by someone else's revelation. I'm giving someone else, listen to what God said, I'm going to give someone else what you need. And you're going to have to come together to get it. Because I've designed it that way. I don't want you living just me and God. I want you living in community, in a congregation. I want you to congregate. I want you to come together. So in the Old Testament, that's where we get our word congregation from. They were always called the congregation. Um, have you ever heard of the signal trumpets? Because most people never even heard of them. The signal trumpets. So let me show you a place where the Bible tells, calls them the signal trumpets in Numbers, and then we'll back up a little in Numbers to show you where God told Moses to make them and what they were for, all right? So Numbers 31, verse 6, Then Moses sent them to war with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. So that's 31, 6. Now back up Numbers 10, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself, and you shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for, number one, calling the congregation, and for directing the movement of the camps. And then in verse 9, And when you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you. Anyone have an enemy who tries to oppress you? Okay. Then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before the Lord, Lord your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. Here's what he said. He said, edification, coming together, and we just read, when you come together, it's, done, it's all for edification. So edification, direction, and protection. Three points again. <laughs> all good sermons, but three points. In preaching class, I remember one student asked the preaching professor, how many points should a good sermon have? He said, at least one. <laughs> I thought that's pretty good. It should not be a pointless sermon. <laughs> Edification. Why, why come together? I'll tell you right now. Why, why come to church? Because you need to be edified. You need to have direction in your life. And you need protection from the enemy. And you know the one the wolf catches? The one that's on the fray. The one that's on the edge. The one that only comes every now and then. 
that doesn't attend the classes, that doesn't go through growth path, that doesn't go through next steps, that doesn't go on in God. Listen, you're a sheep, right? We're all sheep. That's what the Bible says. We all like sheep have gone astray. We're the sheep of his pasture. Okay, so if you're on the fray, here's what you need to do. Excuse me, 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 excuse me. And you need to get right in the middle of the flock. Because the wolf's going to catch the ones on the edge. Is that right? You need brothers and sisters around you. We need the body of Christ. We need each other. And now, now that I've talked about gathering, I'm going to take it a step further. Now I'm going to talk about assembling. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, well, what's the difference between being gathered and being assembled? Well, let me give you an illustration. If I brought you over to the house and I said, hey, I got a new truck. You want to see my new truck? Yeah, let me see your new truck. And we walk out and open up the garage door. And there's a steering wheel over there, four tires over there, engine over there, transmission over there, parts all over the garage. And you say, um, you know your truck's not assembled, right? Yeah, but it's gathered. It's gathered. It's all in one room. Of course, your next question would be, uh, and you know you're not going anywhere, right? So there's a difference between just being gathered and being assembled. Everybody following me? When they blew the trumpets, you know what God told them? Assemble. Don't just gather, assemble. It's like bricks. There's one thing to see a pile of bricks. And each brick has individual worth and individual beauty and individual strength. If you think about it, one brick has strength. Get hit in the head with one, it's got strength. It's got individual worth. I don't know, two bucks a brick or something. I don't know what they're worth individually. Uh, An individual beauty. I guess the brick has some beauty by itself. But when you take those bricks and you begin to rightly relate them to other bricks, their worth, their strength, and their beauty is increased. And a lot of churches are just piles of bricks. But if you just assemble them, guess what you have? A house. A house where someone can dwell. Where you can meet with and speak with someone. Now you might think, well, that's a good, two good illustrations about the car and the bricks and assembling. But do you have a scripture on it, Pastor? (laughs) You think I got a scripture on it? Well, do you have a...
New Testament one. Use Old Testament a lot. Do you have a New Testament one? <laughs> yeah, I do. Got one that you've read before, but you've probably never seen it in this light. Hebrews 10.25. Not forsaking the what? <laughs> the assembling of ourselves together. As is the manner of some. But exhorting one another, watch this, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Church attendance shouldn't be decreasing, it should be increasing because the day is approaching. We should be going to church more. We should be gathering more. We should be assembling more. So another thing that happened that I'll never forget at Shady Grove was... Uh, we would tell people, if you have a testimony, share. Now we do like video testimonies, you know. And so people would come up sometimes and share with the pastor, and the pastor would decide, would this be a good moment to share that, or um, is this a good week, or, you know, how do we do this, you know. So this guy talked with one of the pastors, and then one of the pastors in a time in worship said, I want you guys to hear this guy's testimony. So this man said, I'm not from around here. I live in another state. But several months ago, our daughter was diagnosed with an incurable disease. And a few weeks ago, we came to the hospital here in Dallas to see if they could help her. And on Friday, a week ago, before last weekend, they called us in and they said, um, there's nothing we can do to save your daughter. She was about eight years old. We would suggest that you take her this weekend and do something fun. Some parents decide to sh tell their, their children, some don't. Whatever you decide. But then bring her back on Monday and we're going to start some treatment to try to prolong her life. But we can't save her life. So he said, I'd heard about this church. I'd heard about how you worship and how God shows up. So last weekend we came and he said, it was incredible. We sensed the presence of God. We could feel God's presence. We were all encouraged. No one prayed for us though. No one talked to us. He, 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 he didn't ask. It wasn't that no one talked to him. They didn't come forward and ask for prayer. They just were in the service and they sensed God's presence during worship. He said on Monday, we went back for her to start getting her treatment. And they came back in a little while and said, um, we're getting some odd results. We need to run some more tests. And so all that day they ran tests. And all day Tuesday they ran tests. And all day Wednesday they ran tests. And on Thursday they came in and they said, we don't know what happened. But your daughter doesn't have that disease anymore. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. The presence and the power and the people of God came together. And when the people of God come together, his presence and his power are released. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to just take a moment like we do every weekend and just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? And again, I'm, I'm one, I'm, there's nothing I'm trying to correct in the church. I'm not trying to correct us at all. I just want to answer a very valid question. Why go? Why go? And when we can't go, thank God that we can still watch the service on the internet. And we can still hear the message. Even sometime during the week, we could listen to the message. Thank God for that. But when we can go, why? Because his presence and his power are released when his people come together.